Hello, everybody, and um, I'm delighted to be here at this amazing global event. Um, the title of my talk, as Will mentioned, is Skillful Teaching for Enhanced Student Engagement in Study Skills. This is partly in homage to the many skilled teachers that I've had the privilege of working with over several decades. And I'm going to draw on the work of some of these during my talk today. My talk is going to consider three main themes. These are the importance of continuing study skills development throughout the student journey, steps that teachers can take to make students um, study skills more effective, and how we can generate and harness peer effects to boost motiv motivation and engagement. Um, I will mention a number of source materials as I go through, but you don't need to scribble it all down because they will all be um, provided at the end. For teachers, we have vested interests in students doing well. We love our specialist subject, so we want students to engage with the course, to complete it and be well motivated to learn. We want them to achieve well with confidence and enjoyment and minimum stress. Students have a vested interest too, of course. Generally, they arrive at university wanting to complete their course, to achieve high grades and a good degree to graduate into a desirable job and make their family proud. In doing so, they want to feel confident and that they can cope. They also need time for themselves and their social lives, which means good time management and skill in managing the study process competently, efficiently and effectively. Study skills are a mechanism for enabling study success. Well, it would be ideal if students engage with study skills from day one. And one might assume, given that vested interests are so well aligned, that students would be strongly motivated to improve their study skills, maybe even demanding more. However, it's a common lament of teachers that students don't engage sufficiently or at an early enough stage, too often waiting until they start to struggle or fail or become overstressed. Many students arrive with a naive belief that just because they have a place at university, they already know all there is to know about learning and academic study. We hear comments such as, we did it at school, showing that they don't realise that higher education will make different demands. And then bit by bit, reality hits. Students who achieved brilliantly at school can find it hard when they're not top of the class at uni. This can lead to a crisis of confidence, overworking or apathy, and questioning whether to bother at all. It can be both stressful and demotivating. And then there are students who achieve well, but they don't understand why. They don't know what to do to ensure that they maintain their grades. They lack conscious competence. That can also be demotivating and stressful because success feels random and could easily slip away. A comment I often hear from lecturers is that too many students are just cruising. Once they realise that they won't gain either the highest grades nor fail, they settle for doing just enough to gain a reasonable grade. They don't see the point of pushing themselves, they're quite happy to slip under the radar, which can have a negative effect on the whole class. All tutors note that even when students are bright in some ways, they struggle in others. They turn up late for class or half asleep or they miss sessions or they don't get their assignments submitted on time to so get penalties for them. Or their work is rushed or doesn't deliver on the brief. Or they struggle with self-management, being unable to manage emotions or their own well-being or to cope with setbacks or to work collaboratively with others. Weak study habits and a narrow range of study skills affects their work and the work of other students. One issue is that higher level study involves a wide range of interdependent skills. Academic skills such as critical analysis and reading, research, problem solving, writing assignments, these are obviously essential. However, these are only part of the story. Students don't um, always recognize that people skills and task management and self-management are also essential 
and are increasingly important at higher levels of study and for graduate jobs. These kinds of skills are not just learned overnight. It takes time to develop the art of collaborating effectively on complex study projects, taking the lead and motivating others, sorting out the conflicts that arise, and all whilst managing your own time and emotions and stress levels. Students have an advantage if they can grasp early on that they need to keep developing study related skills. And teachers can help by clarifying the reasons for this, that students will encounter work of increasing complexity and difficulty at each level of study in terms of the concepts and the texts and the problems and the thinking ability. This requires enhanced study skills. They will undertake larger tasks and assignments which will make greater demands on their organisational skills, on their time management and on their motivation. And in most subjects, they will have increased responsibility towards other people. They may have to work with students on research projects or consider the needs of clients and patients and employers or businesses. And then they have to adapt to new teaching methods and technologies and changes made by professional bodies or the economy and the job market. And they'll have to take on personal responsibility for their own learning and more so as they go to higher levels, completing more difficult tasks in less time and with increased levels of autonomy. And that calls for increased self-management, taking charge of their attitudes and their time, their emotions and their well-being so they can study effectively under pressure. So we can see that development must be ongoing for many reasons the increasing range of skills and sub-skills that are required, the need to apply skills with increasing levels of sophistication and to combine and apply skills to new contexts and with automaticity using well-established good study habits. Students benefit from becoming conscious of their abilities, able to play to their strengths and manage their weaknesses and reflecting on skills and performance over time can deepen self-awareness to help them to, throw, to, throw, to cope and to thrive. So a key task for lecturers in higher education is to get students to appreciate that it is not enough just to learn facts, but they need to become more adept at learning and at applying learning. So we want students to be well motivated and engaged in their own development becoming increasingly sophisticated and habituated in using a wider range of study skills with conscious competence. And we want that for the whole cohort, not just for a few individuals. Now teachers notice that some classes struggle, but in others, all the students seem motivated and engaged and achieve better than expected. They are all stars. When I was Director of Lifelong Learning at the University of Leeds, we had some classes that were just amazingly engaged and sparkling. And we wanted that for all of our classes. So we looked hard at the differences between cohorts, such as at the student demographics or changes in the teaching or the timing or the co content and so on. And our investigations revealed that the main reason was how they bonded as a group. It was some kind of peer effect. Key characteristics of students in these successful classes were that they bonded strongly, seeing themselves as being on a journey together. They got to know each other well, they relaxed with each other and shared experiences. They recognised the challenges that others faced and gave mutual support inside and outside of class. As a result, they developed a strong sense of identity as a group. They were committed to completing the course as a group. They motivated each other and being part of the group boosted their motivation too. So that was useful to know. Our next question was, well, what steps can we take to bring about great peer effects with all of our students by design rather than leaving it to chance? Being academics, we started by hunting through the research. There was quite a lot about school children, but mainly showing negative peer effects. There wasn't and still isn't very much about undergraduates. 
In 2011, Sacerdote undertook a summary of the research that there was on peer effects in higher education. It suggested some marginal academic effects for weak undergraduates if they shared a dorm room with a strong student. Also, it found that the social impacts of peers were more significant and sadly, mostly negative, such as encouraging alcohol abuse, smoking and unhelpful behaviours. Research since then still focuses on the impact of sharing a dorm with a more able student. Brunello did find some positive peer effects from this, but only for science students. Hassan and Bagda found positive peer effects from dorm sharing, even if students were from very different social backgrounds. Filade and colleagues with a small sample of Nigerian students found positive peer influence did benefit academic performance in their case, and they recommended better staff awareness of the possibilities of peer effects and closer oversight of peer relationships by the university. And Chung, using a larger sample of 3,000 students, found that the strongest influence was amongst peer of the same social class. Interestingly, Chung differentiated between direct and indirect peer influence. Direct influence involves making active use of peer networks as a study resource. This might be through sharing notes or revising together and generally mobilizing support when they need it. Indirect influence is more about a group adopting each other's values and habits and behaviors. Chung identified three main ways that this occurs. First, students change their attitudes and motivation and choices or behaviours from regarding a peer as a role model or possibly as competition. Secondly, there is the pressure of conforming to an evolving group identity, such as to avoid being left out of the group. And thirdly, social contagion, when ideas just spread amongst the peer group. And all of these could have a negative or a positive effect. One further study to note by Griffith and Rask. They argue that the driving force behind peer effects lies in the transfer of general academic know-how know rather than in the teaching of specific knowledge or social proximity. In other words, peer effects are useful mainly in communicating generic or study skills. At Leeds, our students in the Lifelong Learning Centre didn't share dorms. And they all had different and difficult educational histories, so it wasn't possible or even useful to identify them as strong and weak. However, we could see that peer effects could be positive, including for academic study and motivation, and for the whole cohort rather than just for individuals, and also for a wide age range for the older students as well as the adolescents. Our experience at Leeds and research such as Griffith and Rask's brought home two points that I want to note. Firstly, that academic outcomes for a student are not necessarily just the results of individual effort and ability. The cohort that you are in can affect your grades and your outcomes for better or worse. So skillful teachers who can generate the right kind of cohort mindset and behaviors create advantages for their students. And secondly, peer effects and study skills have mutual benefits. A skillful teacher can create an environment where study skills and cohort effects continually reinforce each other, a virtuous circle. So that brings us back to the questions, what steps could we take to create the right environment to achieve the kind of positive peer effects we want by design rather than by chance? And how can we generate and harness such peer effects to increase motivation and conscious competence of study skills? We pulled our experiences of what we had seen work well and also what we'd seen go horribly wrong. I'm going to share with you now some of the approaches that we used at Leeds and also some drawn from other provision. I'm not saying that these are the best or the only ways of doing things, 
but I hope that you will find something in them to stimulate ideas relevant to your own contexts. To achieve the cohort effects we wanted, we had seen that bonding and a sense of belonging really mattered. We couldn't assume that these would just happen. Furthermore, even if a group did bond well, that might not last. Communications can go wrong, misunderstandings happen, arguments occur, and all of this can disrupt the group. A sense of belonging and bonding and mutual interest has to be continually nurtured. But how? What steps should we take? Well, we didn't have superpowers and we weren't going to resort to hypnotism, tempting maybe, but you know, ethics. So instead, we started by looking very carefully at how we designed the first few weeks of the year. We wanted to engage students from the start and nurture skills and attitudes that fostered positive cohort effects. That meant designing tasks to integrate a wide range of skills, covering academic, people, task, and self-management skills from the first day. One of the things that often goes wrong in unbonded groups is that new students are nervous, anxious, or brittle being in a new group. They act this out in ways that make others even more anxious, worried, or suspicious. We decided to address this head on during student orientation week using the hopes and fears activity. This is relatively easy to run and it helps teachers to get a sense of what is going on for students. And it opens up lots of good opportunities for teaching points. When students share some of their worries about starting on the course, they realize that they're not alone in being a bit nervous or anxious. They start to feel less tense and to relax a little bit. And it's then easier to open up to someone about what they hope to gain from being a student on the course. And then it's likely that they will find other things in common. Also, we wanted students to connect to hope as hope is a factor in student success. So this was the recipe. First, reassure students that it is natural to be apprehensive at the start of a new course and mention a few typical anxieties. Then ask them to spend a few minutes talking to the nearest person about any worries they have and that you'll tell them when to swap over. When they've both had a go, ask each pair to join another pair and to make together an anonymous list of issues that come up. Then in the full group, each set contributes items for the teacher to compile a list of all the shared fears, fears and anxieties and worries, and then talk about them a little bit together. Once students are reassured that they are not alone in their fears and that they've survived the first activity, they form pairs to talk about their ambitions and hopes from being on the course. And then once back together as a class, they are invited to share these. It's a good moment, because it's usually one of relief and rather upbeat, to promote the idea that students can encourage and support each other. It just gets that group bonding going. And we told students that when a class supports each other, everyone tends to do better. And then this is usually a good time to offer some food and drink so that students can follow up with some informal chat. As students have been asked to reveal anxieties, these should be addressed. This might be through discussing well-being and introducing support services and suggesting resources. The study skills handbook that we were talking about earlier, that's the green one there, that provides guidance and activities and tips such as on managing anxieties and stress and looking after your well-being and building resilience. It also looks in detail at ambitions, setting personal goals and making sense of higher education and what can seem rather strange academic conventions. So it's reassuring and practical. Skills for Success, the purple book, is next level up, looking in more depth at topics such as emotional intelligence and dealing with uncertainty and change and personal planning towards work and careers. And the 50 way books are full of quick tips and activities on specific aspects that students might be worried about, such as managing stress or how to get good grades. If students need calm and perspective and better concentration, then mindfulness for students is useful. As students start to relax with each other, we need to think how we deepen that sense of bonding. 
In the USA, sub-colleges apparently send all their, college, their students off camping, but that isn't for everybody. Easier and more accessible methods are available. One way is to provide students with structured activities to share information about themselves in relative safety. For example, Skillful One opens with this activity about the impact of birth order on future career. Students are asked to consider together whether this applies to them and their family. It provides an, an interesting angle for getting to know each other a little bit. And you too could consider if the infographic works for you. If you're a middle child and a teacher, then maybe so. If you're first born, then you might be just on your way to becoming the company boss or maybe an astronaut. Life story posters are a particularly useful way of students sharing events important to them. Again, this can provide invaluable insights for teachers and opening points for peers to start meaningful conversations outside class. It could help the group to understand why peers behave as they do. It develops empathy. I've seen life story posters used successfully on many kinds of course, from English classes right through to executive leadership courses. And there are many activities students can use in both the study skills handbook and skills for success. Structured reflections help them to think through their values, personal characteristics, their approaches to learning and their, even their life metaphors, so they can make more sense of their own responses and behaviours. And discussing them helps the rest of the group get to know them and understand them better. The cohort knows more about what to expect from each other and why, and how to be more helpful in what they ask and say. And all of this is especially useful if the class comes under pressure or when things go wrong. There are loads of ways that lecturers can stimulate a sense of the group cohort. Here are just a few that have worked well. Sharing my desk photos with tips on how to get organized for study, or reviewing personal goals and challenges so that peer investment in their story continues, or creating shared memories, especially through tasks where peers get to see a different side of each other than that of student, or fundraising for a class reward, maybe a trip or a special lunch together, and celebrating shared achievements, of course, with group photos and web pages. One approach that I like is the Face the Fears peer project. For this, the teaching team identifies which parts of the course students are most worried about, or maybe even dread. Typically, it will be about some larger task later in the course, often in the final year, such as research or group projects or making a presentation. There is usually some fear of the unknown. So the lecturers design an activity that demystifies that part of the course and get students to face some of the fear. The idea is to reassure them, not terrify them. So this is undertaken as an intense but low pressure fun activity as a group that also helps them to bond. It has the additional function of identifying the skills demands of the course and the need to keep developing study skills. At the University of Bedfordshire, for example, fashion and marketing students were asked to design outfits and put on a fashion show at the end of the first two weeks of the course. Staging, lighting and presenting it to staff and friends as an event, using only basic materials that they could find, such as paper and bin bags and odd bits of cloth and such like. They had to be imaginative and work together. They had a load of fun and created a good class memory. Then afterwards, they watched videos of final shows by third year students. They reflected together on their own show and the video in order to audit the gap between their current skills and those they would need when they put on their big show at the end of the course. And the lecturers mapped out when and how they would develop those skills, which was very reassuring. A different example with the same principles, foundation level students at the University of Leeds were fearful of doing research projects in their final year. So the teachers set a challenge to put on a conference of their own for tutors, friends and family, presenting some research that they did themselves. 
The students rose to the challenge in a fantastic way. They did some research, albeit quite small. They organized the conference and reflected on the experience together, identifying the skills that they'd still needed to develop. Lecturers again explained when and how they would develop those skills throughout the course. And then there was a lovely celebration with friends and family. You can see them in the photo there. And all this forged a sense of cohort, of developing and achieving something quite big together. On another course at Leeds, in the first week, tutors wanted to draw attention to common mistakes made when writing assignments, and especially the importance of using the marking criteria. They also wanted students to get to know each other through a fun, memorable, low pressure, but purposeful activity. And they did so using cake. So they asked students in groups to make cakes using these criteria. The cake had to be chocolate, round, ice door decorated, serve six to eight people, taste good, of course, be finished, not sliced or cut and original, that is, all of their own work. And then the students had to evaluate all of the cakes against the criteria, doing that together, and then they could eat them. Teachers used the activity to demonstrate teaching points such as these. So obviously this collection of ingredients is not a cake. Similarly, throwing a lot of facts together doesn't make a good written assignment. This looks like a great cake, but it's not chocolate. So it's not on topic. A great assignment that isn't on topic won't get good grades. These cakes don't meet the criterion for structure. They're not round. And this one isn't iced, so it doesn't meet the criterion for presentation. This one, not on the right scale. I don't think that's going to feed six to eight people. Similarly, assignments have a size of their own. They have to meet the word limits. This one is salty. That's a great big bag of salt there. The contents let it down. And this one is unfinished. If assignments are not submitted by the deadline, there are penalties. And these don't pay attention to details, that is, not to cut or slice them. These cakes show that there are many ways to be original just by doing the work oneself. And that fear of producing something original is often one that concerns students. And these sets of cakes clarify that it is still plagiarism, whether you are making an exact copy of another cake or piece of work, or making a near copy, or just cutting bits and pieces together from more than one place, or passing someone else's work off on as your own. When working in groups like this, we want students to be able to reflect constructively together about their own study skills and habits. This normally requires resources to structure the reflect reflection and the sharing. Shapes is a set of tools I developed with students to help them think about their study behaviours from multiple angles. Shapes stands for skills, habits, attitudes, preferences, experiences and strategy. It is introduced as a concept in the study skills handbook, but students can really go into a lot more depth using it in skills for success. They start off by completing six self evaluations, such as this one this is the one for habits. And when they map their ratings, that generates different kinds of patterns or shapes. So we can just take a look at a few. So here on the left, Juan assesses himself the same way in week one and week eight. He identifies no weaknesses, but not many strengths or much development either. Kim on the right thinks her skills improved by week eight as she gained more experience of university study. In week one, Kate feels her personal preferences obstruct her effectiveness. By week eight, she thinks that's no longer the case. Her preferences have moved across to the right and she's stronger in her attitude and in her study habits too. Now, peers might ask her if the three areas of improvement are related and what she does now differently. The fourth student, Ung, despite feeling that she has relevant study experience in week one, starts out by giving week ratings for everything else. Peers might query why that is. By week eight, 
she's more confident, especially in her attitude. Peers might ask her what is different about her attitude and what is the impact of that on her study. Discussing their self ratings and their shapes together helps peers to understand each other and how to offer relevant mutual support. Changing study habits takes time. Peers can help each other stay motivated. They can track their progress in shaping new habits by using habit shaping tools, such as this in the Bloomsbury Student Planner. And there are also habit trackers in the back of my 50 way books as well. So we have looked at actions largely that together help to create good peer effects. But even in groups that have bonded well initially, things can go wrong. And that's one reason why students really need people skills and self-management skills as study skills to help them manage more complex situations and tasks as they progress through the course. And teachers can help them to develop these skills over time, progressing to higher levels. For example, they might introduce discussion skills using this activity in Skillful Book 2. This starts with some tips from the Study Skills Handbook on how to enable good group discussion. The activity then reinforces learning points, asking students to match up tips with spoken sentences that express these. Students could then follow up this introduction in more depth using the Study Skills Handbook. Its guidance leads students step by step through the processes of setting up, running, evaluating and improving group and teamwork. Students can learn how to give and receive constructive criticism, to communicate better with other people, to deal with difficult situations that might arise in the group. And the self-evaluation tools help them to evaluate their own role and their skills needs and their performance within group work. Students can then progress to more in-depth considerations of skills that contribute to effective team working, group work and leadership. They can learn how to create effective teams, to undertake active listening and to develop rapport and trust, to understand about team dynamics and more. They can work with others to evaluate how well they contribute to the groups and how to understand and better manage their own and other people's emotions in a group context in order to help the groups work smoothly. All of these skills can help groups to work effectively and they're also very valuable for working life. One increasingly important aspect of academic contexts is being able to work effectively and harmoniously alongside people from different cultures. Tutors on English courses might start by considering cultural difference using an activity such as this in Skillful. It can be interesting to look at how cultures differ and especially if students can offer examples of their own and also perhaps bringing out similarities between cultures. Students can then progress to a systematic understanding of cultural competence and its application in the Study Skills Handbook. The 2019 edition now has a whole chapter on this. Before I conclude, at the MENA symposium recently, attendees asked about resources for helping to teach and scaffold study skills. And I know that a lot of work is done on that by Macmillan. But if resources interest you on that, this book also might help. It's been around for a while, but much of it is still very relevant for understanding the students' learning and development um, and looking at study skills teaching in a whole range of contexts from class to teaching individuals and groups. So to conclude, students need to build study skills at each level of study, including people and self-management skills. Strongly bonded cohorts can create positive peer effects, such as motivation, sharing of reflections and perseverance. With the right support and resources, peers can nurture each other's study skills and good study habits. But one can't take it for granted that classes or groups will gel. Skillful teachers can help groups to bond from the outset and help them develop the skills that will maintain positive peer effects. They can make study skills engaging fun and supportive so that students are helped to become more reflective and self-aware, more open to discussing their studies and offering mutual support. This can create a virtuous circle. Peer effects can help study skills and in turn, good study skills can nurture positive cohort effects. Thank you very much.
Hi, Stella. Thank you so much. What a wonderful talk. That really covered it in such a, such a wide breadth. Thank you so much for putting that together for us. You're welcome. <laughs> Great. Great. It's getting well, my voice back now. <laughs> yes, right. We've got a couple of questions. Do you have time for, for a couple? Indeed, yes. Whether I can answer them is a whole other matter, but I'll have to go. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, a couple of people have mentioned their, uh, their time. So a lot of people are constrained by their curriculum uh, that is sort of prescribed by their institution. Um, do you have some advice? Because you're, you're sort of offering lots of supplementary activities on top of that. Do you have some advice of how they could fit that in somehow? Well, I can't magic time much as I'd no. like to. I think a lot goes into the the ways in which tasks are created. And I think the um, some of the examples that we're giving, you, you, you could see that a very vast range of skills were being incorporated because of the way in which those tasks were designed. Um, mm. And I was thinking um, one of the teachers who had designed the, uh, the cakes activity, she was very good at, for all of her teaching, of thinking, how can I... Um, get the students within the class time to be really working on group tasks and, and the kinds of tasks where they have to think and discuss problems that were quite tricky because that would then generate some of these sort of people issues or bits of discontent etc so that they could yeah. deal with those so that outside of class they could then do more independent study which otherwise they might have just covered by um, talking through on lectures or just sitting in, in much more passive learning so it was partly about equipping the students for much more effective independent learning and group learning um, and that sort of liberated some of the class time in order to be working on some more of the, of the, of the people management and the, the team working skills. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much for that, Stella. Great. Um, so we've also had a, a comment asking about uh, how this might differ in a face-to-face -face or an online environment. Can you speak to that at all? Well, obviously, there are slightly different kinds of tasks in, a, in a, an, an online environment. And you know, a lot depends on what kind of subjects that you're teaching. I, mean, I don't ever sort of think that teachers that haven't got the imagination really to come up with the sorts of things which um, they can can construct as the sorts of activities that students can go away and do. And now with sort of virtual environments and um, people being able to work online, the students can do different kinds of tasks online. Mm -hmm. But there are some kind of advantages potentially of doing some of the interpersonal work online too, because particularly with the male students, it seems that quite often they're more comfortable in expressing some of their feelings when they're doing things, when they, their faces can't be seen in terms of chat. So not necessarily in a, in a Zoom context, but potentially sort of using sort of discussions or forum online um, one can um, do some of that work slightly differently than one might do in class and get different sorts of issues raised I do think in, in either kind of context when one's first starting to do some of that interpersonal work it's really important not just to let the students go off and do it all on their own that they do need to have some kind of moderator if it's online or a teacher or quite skilled person present just at the beginning at least and, and, and just being there as a presence in the background from time to time. Otherwise, what can tend to happen is that when a whole group doesn't gel, the whole group leaves the whole course together. So I okay. think it's a very good investment of the teacher time just to do that a little bit up front and then you have much less of that work to do later on. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Stella. That's really helpful. Um, so we've also had a comment about, so your talk was speaking largely on younger adults, right, or adult learners. Do you think that was the, the activities need to be modified for younger learners? So I'm not an expert in younger learners. I wouldn't really presume to talk about children, um, okay. except to say that there does seem to be an awful lot of... Um, discussion these days of the pressures even on school children which there didn't used to be in the past mm -hmm. so that, that just that general point about creating um time to be discussing emotions and watching how groups interact um would it seems like it would be a beneficial thing so that children don't feel that they're alone and that they're able to manage their stress and their well-being and obviously the more of that we do younger the less of this sort of thing we need to then do sometimes with the elder, elder sure. students I don't think it will ever go away because we know from work contexts even if we've been doing this for a year there are always human issues to be to be dealt with so yeah, yeah I think yeah. it's a lifelong journey that one it certainly is <laughs> yes all right well thank you so much Stella You're welcome that was Oh, that was such a great talk. It was really great to have you again back, you know, working with Macmillan. It's just been a pleasure to work with you. You've been very easy to work with, of course. And yeah, I can't wait to work with you again as well. 
Okay, well, it'll be in a couple of hours. Oh, you, you won't be there in a few hours, will you? But uh, yeah, well, well nice I'll be here in the back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I'll see people later on. Those who are uh, here later, um, right. and I'll, I'll stop sharing. So, good luck with the rest of the the conference then. Thanks a lot, Stella. Speak to you. Bye bye now then. Bye. You will have noticed, I mean, a couple of things that Stella showed in her talk, actually. She showed her wonderful study skills handbook, which I couldn't recommend more. Um, it very much is a handbook uh, and something which you will use as a reference time and time again. Uh, so I couldn't, I can't recommend that book more. Um, and study skills was also, her study skills handbook was also used to inform some of the content of this course that you're looking at here. So in Stella's talk, uh, she showed us uh, the importance of continuing study development through the student journey. Um, she's shown what te steps teachers can take to make study skills more effective, more motivating, uh, engaging and reflective. Skillful Second Edition is a five level academic English course designed for students in university programmes. It helps teachers to prepare students for success in academic university English programmes. So through engaging content, a skills-based syllabus, clear step-by-step -step lessons, and a strong academic focus, students can develop the language, confidence, and skills they need at university and in their future careers. So I can't recommend this book more if you're in that context, if you're training students at university or preparing for university. Study Skills Second Edition really has those step-by-step um, -step, uh, lessons for learners and obviously for the teacher to follow. Uh, throughout the course. So take a look at it at uh, macmillanenglish.com slash skillful second edition. <laughs>